Welcome to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Hi, Joe. Hi, Pam. So in the old days, there was election fraud, and people would talk about election fraud. And it was kind of old-fashioned in a sort of charming way. It was mostly done by politicians. So if you've read Robert Caro's magnificent biography of Lyndon Johnson, you'll read about how they voted hundreds of people in South Texas or, you know, voting the graveyards in Chicago. Uh, Jimmy Carter, you'll be pleased to know after he was president, wrote a poem about running for the state legislature and how he failed to carry even a cemetery. Uh, <laughs> one of the things we knew back then was that the election fraud, we, we kind of knew who carried it out. It wasn't individuals. It was political parties, and they were inside the United States. So we kind of had the assurance that if the two political parties wanted a clean election run, they could do it. Yeah, we weren't worried about an outside nation, for example, messing up the, the votes. One of our parties might do it, and then we generally know which party in which area might do it. And I guess we also didn't worry about some outside uh uh, nation interfering with our election process through propaganda. We might have done it to other countries, but people weren't doing it to and, us. And it was localized as well. So we weren't worried about a nationwide uh, conspiracy to undermine the security of one of our elections. But today, we kind of are. I mean, after what happened in 2016, after the worries from 2018 with the Mueller report and the like, uh, people have a reason not to feel as secure about our elections. And our guest today is going to tell us why we should feel more secure or shouldn't, or in any case, what, what should we do? And uh, our guest is uh, Nate Persley, the James uh, McClatchy Professor of Law. He's got appointments in political science and communication, the Freeman Spogli Institute. Welcome, Nate. And he's got a new job as well on top of all of that. He's going to be one of the co-directors of a cyber uh, policy center at Stanford. So tell us a little bit about your newest your newest hat. Well, yes, this is uh, adding on to the other hats that, that I've got here. Um, first of all, good to be with you again. Uh, the, the Cyber Policy Center was born out of um, what was the cyber initiative of the Hewlett Foundation that had been... Um, they had given some grants to different universities to develop programs at the intersection of technology, democracy, and security. And so this Cyber Policy Center is a stitching together of several kind of existing programs here at Stanford. One is the program on democracy and the internet that I run with Frank Fukuyama and uh, Rob Reich. It also includes uh, the Global Digital Policy Incubator, which is sort of looking at global human rights in the internet, run by Eileen Donahoe and Larry Diamond. Then we have a what's called the Internet Observatory, which is being run by Alex Stamos, the former uh, head of security for Facebook, who's now teaching at Stanford. And then finally, there's a program on geopolitics, technology, and governance, which is run by Andy Grotto, who uh, worked in cybersecurity in the White House. So we're really trying to bring all of those, all that talent we have at Stanford into under one roof at FSI uh, to think about these questions, these sort of urgent questions of democracy, technology, and security. And as you're launching this, one of the, which is launching this month, um, one of the things that you're going to do right at the beginning is a report uh, that's called Securing the uh, securing uh, Democratic Elections or Securing American Elections. Can you tell us a little bit about your work on that? So one of the sort of problems and challenges emerging out of the 2016 election is that we have never had a 9-11 style report uh, investigating what went on and then proposing solutions. We've had, as you mentioned, the Mueller report, which has talked a little bit about um, specifically what was happening with the campaigns and what the uh, now president may have done. Um, but leaving partisanship aside, just to deal with the problem of foreign interference in U.S. elections, we really haven't grappled with it as a country, and certainly we haven't pa passed the necessary laws uh, and regulations. And so uh, this is an attempt to bring the talent that we have at, here at Stanford to bear on this question, to come up with suggestions to policymakers and to uh, social media platforms to deal with election intervention in the United States. So tell us, Nate, some of the problems we had looking at 16 and 18 and what an approach to solving some of those problems might be. So when you look at the 
attempts that the Russians made to influence that election and to sow division and doubt in the American public, um, it came on sort of many fronts. First, there's the actual hardware of the elections. So whether it's the voter registration system, the actual uh, vendors of electronic voting machines, or um, electronic poll books, there are examples of where the Russians tried to probe these data systems and to get at the um, the technology itself. Um, there's no evidence that they altered votes, but there's certainly evidence that they tried to get inside the system. Uh, beyond that, a lot of it deals with the um, the campaigns themselves. So we now know uh, that the Russians or Russian agents or, or agents of the Russian government uh, purchased ads on Facebook and other social media platforms. Over 100,000 uh, dollars worth of ads were purchased on Facebook, actually some in rubles. Um, uh, that would have been a tip-off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, partly that that's part of the story here, which is that a lot of the mechanisms that we should have had in place to deal with sort of uh, as early warning signals were not there. So they purchased ads, but but ads were really just the tip of the iceberg. They, uh, there was an organized propaganda operation to affect sort of minds on uh, how people should vote uh, in the 2016 election. So you saw it in organic content that was on the platforms. You saw it in the uh, official broadcasting or media uh, uh, entities from Russia, like Russia Today or uh, Sputnik. And so this report really tries to get at that kind of multi-sided nature of the problem. And, you know, I read that uh, part of the report, Nate, and I was astounded to know that Russia Today, which my guess is most of our listeners and viewers haven't even heard of, was at one point something like the 30, 30th most active site or looked at site on, on the web. What were they What were they purveying? One of the interesting things about Russia Today, now called RT, is that uh, most of what they do is not news per se. They have what... Some people call it disaster porn, like you know, man eaten by alligator in in uh, in Florida, uh, and so they do all kinds of uh, other kind of inside edition or sensationalist uh, journalism to build an audience, and then they pepper it with with purely political content. And so if you if you read it often, as I do, and subscribe to their Twitter feed, um, you see all of this sort of sensationalist and kind of interesting content that they put out there, most of which is true. And it's important to understand, and this is why the sort of debate over fake news is somewhat beside the point, uh, well over 90% of whatever you see on these foreign uh, propaganda stations are uh, is true. Um, and so they built it, they built an audience and then during an election, they did at times rival sites like Vox and Huffington Post in terms of the audience that they would get. This is Stanford Legal. And today we're talking about securing American elections and cybersecurity with Nate Persley. Joe? Well, Nate, you're talking about Russia today. And I don't know if you remember this, but at one point I was uh, scheduled to do an interview with them about one of my thoughts on tax. Well, I didn't even know what RT meant. Uh, fortunately, I had you to elucidate me on that, and I declined the interview. What can we do about this? First of all, I take it that notwithstanding the fact they do a lot of legitimate stuff, this exists to get across kind of Putin's goals there. Well, that's right. It is connected to the Russian government, but it's connected in an indirect way. Um, but uh, the sort of head management at RT has ex sort of made clear that it has uh, priorities that are uh, consistent with the Russian government. Um, and, you know, as you said, most people don't know what RT even stands for. And if you look at even billboards in Manhattan, you'll see or, or subway uh, signs that, that advertise for it. It says RT question more. That's the that's the um, uh, the slogan for RT, and it looks like a totally legitimate news organization. And if you watch it, you know it's very professionally done, and you actually have some kind of historic sort of TV personalities from the U.S. who are on that station. I mean, one of the things you've said in another context, Nate, is that once people start getting their news from Facebook, everything looks alike to them in a way that uh, the example you've given is you know if you go to the supermarket and you see. Uh, a, a, a newspaper right next to the checkout desk, and it says, you know, Hillary Clinton eats babies for lunch, uh, also Pizzagate. Uh, you're going to say, yeah, n I'll wait until I get home and watch the news. But on a Facebook feeder, like everything looks the same to you, so that people's ability to critically judge is quite different. Is that a threat to our elections? Well, that's right. The, the, um, 
RT, right, comes at you in your Facebook newsfeed alongside the New York Times, alongside your, you know, son's graduation video, alongside um, advertisements and the like. And so it's really about the content as opposed to the source. And so we don't have any of the cues that we have in the offline world um, t- as to the veracity and progeny of the material, right? And so that's the problem, which is that um, people are sort of exposed to this kind of information or communication, and they don't have the tools that they have in the offline world to evaluate it. And so the, the democracy-threatening problem comes from the fact that it becomes even easier for someone, you know, 3,000 miles or 10,000 miles away to uh, put up content that then will have an effect on people's voting decisions. So uh, the, the, it seems to me there are two different ways that this might affect people's voting decisions. One is it might persuade them to vote for or against a particular candidate. And the other is it might cause them to just lose all confidence in the election system and not participate at all. Do you have a sense of which thing Russia was trying to do? I think all of the above. I mean, because what it's clear from the Mueller report that um, the Russian strategy was uh, principally to sow division and doubt about American institutions, but also to, um, you know, say pretty destructive things about Hillary Clinton. Um, some some critical things about Donald Trump as well, but certainly not as much. Um, they. You know, we know, for instance, the Russian advertising campaign also had a lot to say about Bernie Sanders, right? Um, and uh, had some sort of um, praising things to say about him. So it was more about sowing division and doubt, uh, but they clearly had preferences. I don't think the Russians themselves had any inkling that Donald Trump would actually end up being elected, uh, but uh, they certainly didn't like Hillary Clinton. And so we're hoping that at least if she were to be elected, that there'd be doubt in her regime. Well, and and this takes us to the other piece of election security that uh, you're concerned with, which is things like who gets to vote uh, and and who doesn't, which is imagine that Hillary Clinton won and then Donald Trump says, well, three million fraudulent voters or uh, Donald Trump wins and Hillary Clinton claims three million voters uh, vote suppressed. I mean, is that should we be worried about the kind of cyber world and the actual ability of people who are entitled to cast a ballot to cast that ballot and have it counted? So there's, there's two points there. The first is whether the through propaganda you can um, eliminate confidence in the result, right, or degrade sort of uh, confidence in the result. And I think that is a real concern um, that Americans are losing confidence in their democracy. That's true around the world right now that we're seeing. And um, this kind of divisive rhetoric that we're seeing both by elites inside the country as well as uh, being the, those flames being fanned by outsiders is a real concern. Now, how those concerns are then expressed in policy, whether it leads to you know prosecution for um, uh, vote fraud or, or other types of vote suppressive messages, that's something we've been dealing with for some time over the last 10 to 15 years, if not longer. Um, so I think that the, the problem is that all election reform is now seen in a partisan through a partisan lens. And so even trying to counteract these Russian messages is seen through a partisan lens. This is Stanford Legal. And today we're talking about election security in the United States with Nate Persley. Joe? Well, we've had Russian interference with the social media. And now we're talking about Russian interference with voting, either voter registration. And we'll talk in a minute about the actual tabulation of votes. Uh, we'll, Tell us more about some of the solutions. Uh, For example, let's go back to the Russian interference, first of all, in social media. Is there anything we can do about it? Is there anything we are doing about it? So there are several different things that the government can do and then what the social media companies can do and have done. First, uh, in dealing with political advertising, the Internet has been, for the most part, a Wild West where the regulations that we have for television really don't apply on the Internet with some uh, small exceptions. So having greater transparency as to the source of funds that are spent online, I think, is quite important. Um, The social media companies have begun to do that where they have ad – both Google and Facebook and Twitter have uh, ad archives so you can actually see how much is being spent by whom on particular types of communication. There are a lot of things that they could do better on that. Can I just ask you, how well does that work, given that we don't know, even among domestic producers now of political speech, who's doing it? Because 
uh, it's been pushed further and further back in the process into all sorts of independent committees and independent. Experts. I mean, can we actually find out who's paying for particular ads? Well, we could mandate it. I mean, right now, you do, there are some situations under which you can. And one of the ways that Facebook has tried to get at this problem that came up in 2016 is that in order to run a political ad on Facebook, you have to designate a person who receives actually a, a uh, postcard from Facebook to verify their identity to make sure they're not a Russian troll in you know Moscow. That, or but that that would identify who is placing the yeah. ad with Facebook, right? It wouldn't identify who's financing that person, and isn't that really? I mean, that when we think about just domestic ads, that's really what we're talking about. Is we know it's the campaign for responsible citizens right. sponsors this message, but we have no idea who those responsible citizens are down, uh, upstream, if you will. That's right. And that's one of the recommendations we have in this report is that you should actually have some human being who is um, uh, designated as the person behind the ad. So whether it's for you know the Americans for America committee that you're talking about, um, the top five donors to that or the, you know, the top five natural person. Donors, yeah, you right. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that you can actually trace the money back to human beings. Now, in reading the report, Nate, it looks like maybe some progress has been made, at least with respect to yesterday's problems. For example, Facebook has taken some actions against Russia today. I think Google has too, uh, in various ways. So maybe there'll be less of a uh, less of a potent force. Uh, what more can we do on that? Well, there's a lot that we could do. Um, in sort of regulation at the you know federal level, um, there's more that we could do at the state level to deal with things like the election machinery, making sure that there's paper audit trails um, to make sure that um, voting machines aren't hacked. Um, but we still don't have the regulatory environment or or the authority that we need as a government. We the government doesn't have it. Um, to deal with this kind of organized propaganda operation. And I should say it's really kind of complicated once you start thinking about it, how you deal with the unique threat that Russia poses um, in an area of heightened First Amendment concern like, like elections. So how do you regulate RT and Sputnik, the other uh, media site that Russia runs, without you know, preventing the BBC or um, the, uh, you know, the Canadian broadcasting system from also being subject to the same rules. Um, what are the reasons why we want to um, either have greater disclosure or regulation of, of these particular entities and where do you draw the line? I mean, and would we forbid them, you know, we have laws that forbid campaign contributions by non-U.S. citizens, but can we really have a law that forbids the provision of news by foreign news sources and the like. It seems to me that's a really difficult question if you take the First Amendment seriously and if you think people ought to have an opportunity to hear other people's points of view. And when we come back, we'll hear more from Nate Persley, our guest, about how to think about these issues on Stanford Legal on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Joe? Uh, uh, thank you, Pam. And Nate, right before the break, we started to talk about the elections themselves. You're going to hear a lot of people, particularly on the losing side, saying, we didn't really lose. The Russians kind of hacked the voting machine. So talk to us first about whether that catastrophic vision is correct, and then what we could do to make sure, one way or the other, that we've got safe voting machines. One of the strange things about the 2016 election is that it was the winner who casted doubt on the results, right? Which is that you usually yeah. don't expect the winner to say that three to five million fraudulent votes were, were cast. So Sad. you actually had this strange uh, phenomenon there. Um, nevertheless, once the the sort of efforts of the Russian government and its agents to have an effect on the election came out, then there was concern about uh, the election machinery. And the three areas I mentioned before were the voting machine vendors, the electronic uh, poll books, and then the voter registration systems that the states have. You They're, might want to explain to people what an electronic poll book is, because I imagine a lot of our listeners don't know that. So when, for in some states, when you go to um, 
to cast your ballot in the polling place, you someone has a giant book with names in it, um, and then you sign next to your name, and, and uh, they verify your identity somehow, uh, maybe with your signature. Uh, in other states, uh, they actually have an iPad there that meets you, and so you say what your name is, and they type it in, and you either sign on the iPad, or they have some other way of verifying it. So it's a way to get away from all the paper that's involved in uh, voter verification. And then the voter registration system, we have online voter registration systems that's been a trend in the last five to 10 years uh, so that you can actually register online instead of having to fill out you know, papers at the post office. And so there's evidence that the Russians tried to penetrate each one of those systems. Not that they switched votes in the election, um, but then to learn more a little bit about what was um, happening in the election administration infrastructure. And that's concerning because you could see how at each stage of the process, you could, if not change votes, you could make it more difficult for some people to vote, or you could mess with the number of the names that are on the voter registration system. And 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 did they succeed? You've kind of averted that to a little bit. Yeah, no, I don't think that they've succeeded. They succeeded in in changing votes. I mean, I don't think there's any evidence of that. Partly because if if there were, you would have expected to see sort of aberrant rates of support for Trump. Let's say in particular areas based on you know, the technological features of the voting environment. There is no evidence of that. Um, what they were doing is trying to sense in, uh, vulnerabilities. And so a lot of what the Russian playbook is about is trying to figure out where the pressure points are to maybe use them at a later date. I mean, one of the things you know, Nate, uh, from, oh, almost as much from the work you did on the uh, president's commission a couple of years back is after the 2000 election, people realized there was something really wrong with our punch card voting system. And we replaced a lot of those machines, 2002, 2003, uh, with money that the federal government sent to the states. Those machines are now coming to the end of their uh, predicted life cycle. And we don't have either better machines developed or the money to get new machines out there. Should we be worried that not not the Russians, but our own incompetence will lead to massive failures of voting machines in various jurisdictions? So, uh, yes. Uh, and one of the things we should be concerned about is that some of those voting machine vendors don't even exist anymore. And so you have actual election administrators going on eBay to find parts for some of these now defunct machines. Yeah, there's a famous graveyard in New York for the old shoot machines in the old days, the, you know, the, the, the lever machines. Yeah. They would have to cannibalize old machines because the company went out of business decades ago. Right. And so there is concern about not just the security, but also the functionality of a lot of these machines, because, you know, very few of them, um, uh, you know, even use iPad technology because they well predate the I iPad by, say, a decade or so. Uh, so there is concern about the functionality of these machines as well as their security. Some of them run like operating systems that no one services every, you know, anymore, like Windows NT or something like that. Um, and so, yes, we need another infusion of money like we had with the Help America Vote Act to replace some of these aging voting machines. And do you think there's any political will right now to bring our election machinery up to snuff? In some states, there there is that political will because it takes one scandal and then that secretary of state then feels they have to you know reform the voting system. You're seeing it actually in Georgia after a series of scandals uh, that, that they're going to replace some of their voting machines. You see it in uh, Pennsylvania. And a lot of it is done county by county or state by state. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with our guest, Nate Persley, about election security. Joe? Nate, one of the things the report recommends is a paper trail, so that even if you have electronic voting, you can check on it. It rec recommends audits. And what's the status of this? On, on which of those can we say we're getting to where we need to be, and on what are we failing to do. So I think that slowly but surely, the electronic voting machines are being phased out if they don't have a paper trail. Uh, one of the interesting things in the last year or two is that the city of Los Angeles or the county of Los Angeles has actually developed its own voting machine, which has a paper trail. And it's mainly, it may set the standard for the types of voting machines we see in the future. And so I'm confident that we will see uh, continued progress in that area. Um, this question about audits is a, is a 
difficult one. Um, roughly ha half the states have some kind of audit, but what you really want to know is that each aspect of the system is being looked at after an election to make sure that the proper candidate won and that each part uh, is working correctly. And and we've got, you mentioned a failure of political will. I notice w in one place in the report, it uh, cites with an approval uh, a kind of act, and I forget what the name of the act is. Y'all have these names like a Make America Wonderful Act. <laughs> uh, uh, and it was a great act, but I notice only Democrats supported it. And is that the way things are kind of shaking out at the national level, at least, one party versus the other? That is, I think... Uh that is the way things are shaking out, and, it, and it's dispiriting. Um, and one of the reasons we wrote this report is to sound the alarm that this is a bipartisan problem and that we need uh, bipartisan solutions. There are several things in the report that both parties can agree on. Just to give you an example, whether political parties ought to be able to provide significant cybersecurity uh, assistance to the candidate campaigns. Right now, there's you know, there are campaign finance barriers that prevent parties from giving substantial assistance to these uh, campaigns. And that's something both parties could get around. Even the paper trail issue, right? It just, you just need to be on the losing end of a disputed election to realize that you need better um, uh, paper trails. And so it's true that this does get seen through a partisan lens, um, but we're hoping that we can push things through. I mean, one of the th experiences we had after 2000, um, and this played out in the Help America Vote Act is, the Democrats were very worried about the votes that didn't get counted, and the Republicans were very worried about fraud. And at the end of the day, the compromise that they reached didn't necessarily – it's called the Help America Vote Act, but it's not clear how many more people got helped to vote. That is, uh, it's the beginning of the arguments about voter ID mm -hmm. and the like. And I just kind of wonder – you know, what do you think a secure election system would look like in the United States? Well, I mean, that's a that's a big question. I mean, I think that it depends on whether we focus on things like the regulation of social media versus um, regulating the infrastructure. And so I think there are certain technological solutions. One thing that this report does, though, is it doesn't just have recommendations to governments, let alone the federal government. It also has recommendations to the Internet platforms. And where we've seen real action in the last two and a half years is in the private sector, where they have uh, heard the criticisms and are taking pretty significant action. Well, we've been listening to and talking with Nate personally about the new uh, Cyber Policy Center at Stanford and uh, the efforts on securing Americans' uh, election. And one of the things I'm taking away from this, Nate, is the private sector has actually done more than the rest of us in a way because they don't have this partisan gridlock. Unfortunately, kind of inexplicably, only one party is really pushing for a lot of these reforms. That's maybe not surprising, the losing party in the last presidential election. But what I'm also hearing is that it's important not to get so dispirited that we think, say, the election was fixed, because that simply isn't true. Well, that's right. I mean, I think that you know, election reform is an ongoing process. So after the 2000 election and the problems that we saw there, there was the Help America Vote Act. Uh, to respond to issues of campaign finance uh, scandals in the 90s, we have the McCain-Feingold Law. To deal with uh, military and overseas voters, we had the Uniform, UOCAVA, Uniform yeah. Overseas no one can remember uh, Citizens the Voting yeah. Act. To deal with long lines on Election Day, we had the, the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, which led states to adopt a lot of uh, different measures. And so this is the controversy that comes out of the 2016 election. We need similar legislative and sort of NGO efforts to go after these problems. And uh, we'll discover new problems in the 2020 election that we'll need uh, responding to as well. And we'll have you back then. So thanks to Nate personally for joining us. And thanks to our listeners for joining us on Stanford Legal here on SiriusXM Insight 121.